Welcome to the Copyright and Fair Use for Scholars Workshop. I'm Wendy Hybe, Social Sciences Librarian here at Michener Library at the University of Northern Colorado. I must begin with a disclaimer that informs you I am not an attorney. The content I provide today is merely informative and is not intended to be legal advice. And with the Creative Commons licensing, I am being clear as an author that I allow fair use of this slideshow if it is non-commercial use and properly attributed. We have an attorney on campus. His name is Dan Satriana. He is the designated contact for Digital Millennium Copyright Act violations, chiefly music downloading violations. Here's what we'll be covering today. We'll examine our motivations to learn more about copyright and look at the university's copyright related policies. We'll go over basic def definitions and show you various resources. We'll talk about advocates and their special interests. Then we'll jump right in and apply fair use principles together. We'll discuss the results, alternatives fair to fair use, and touch on the TEACH Act and guidelines. Why are you here today? Why do you care? We are fortunate enough to be educators, and so our work involves nurturing students, furthering the progress of science and useful arts. That's some foreshadowing of the constitutional language I'll show you in a few slides. We make use of original works of scholarship in teaching our students. Today we'll be fo focusing on the perspective of the user, but it is crucial to be able to empathize with all three perspectives that of user, creator, and publisher. Renee Hobbs is the author of a book called Copyright Clar Clarity, and she identified these three attitudes as typical among ed educators. There's the see no evil attitude, just choosing to remain ignorant about the law and assuming use is okay if it's educational. There's the close the door attitude. You can do what you want inside your classroom and don't share publicly. And then there's the hyper compliant person who follows rules and doesn't take full advantage of fair use. Are you familiar with this document, the board policy manual? Did you know that it has a section on copyright law compliance? Well, now you do. Here's the fine print. And if I were to amend it, I would add a comma and the word teaching after the word research. All employees of the university shall conduct their activities on behalf of the university, including but not limited to any research or writing activities in such a fashion so as to meet and comply with all requirements of the United States copyright laws. And here's the rest of the fine print. The student code, while emphasizing plagiarism, a related concept, does not address copyright specifically and generically refers to abiding by federal law. So pause a moment and reflect. What is your motivation to watch this workshop today? What are your roles? here at the university. What is your attitude toward copyright law? 
see no evil, close the door, hyper, hyper compliant, or some other stance. And what is your knowledge level? And what current questions do you have? As I foreshadowed earlier, copyright is in the Constitution. The Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. What is copyright? It is the exclusive legal right granted for a speci specified period, the author's life plus 70 years to print, publish, perform, film, or record original material. The holder of copyright has the right to publish and distribute a work in print or other media, to reproduce it, to prepare derivative works, to perform or publicly display the work, and to authorize others to exercise any of the above rights. The Library of Congress U.S. Copyright Office has excellent basic information, including links to regulations and case law. This circular on copyright basics is very understandable and a good place to start. Copyright law has exemptions for educators. You'll notice that I emphasize the statutes in boldface type. They differ from the guidelines, which do not have the force of law. So we'll be focusing on fair use doctrine and the TEACH Act. Fair use doctrine allows for use of a copyrighted work, including such use by reproduction and copies on or phono records or by any other means specified by that section for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, including multiple copies for classroom use, scholarship, or research, and is not an infringement of copyright. In determining whether the use made of a work in any particular case is a fair use, the factors to be considered shall include 1. The purpose and character of the use, including whether such use is of a commercial nature or is for nonprofit educational purposes. 2. The nature of the copyrighted work. 3. The amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole. And 4. The effect of the use upon the potential market for or value of the copyrighted work. We'll return to the four factors of fair use in a few slides. Here I want to introduce you to our library research guide about copyright. It will contain a summary of what we go over today and will be a good resource for you. If you don't remember any URL from this presentation except this one, you'll be in good shape because this one is a touchstone. I hope you use it. And here's another great guide about finding and using images and sounds and vetting them for copyright restrictions. So as I said before, there are a range of stances toward copyright and there are various perspectives of users, creators, and publishers. 
And you can see here is an issue of the CQ Researcher that deals with clashes over copyright. It's a complicated and controversial er issue. And that makes it interesting. A community of practice is a group of people who share a craft or a profession. This uh, screenshot is of the Scientific, Technical, and Medical Publishers um, website. They're a community of practice. They're a, a coalition of publishers. And they've decided to approach uh, fair use and copyright in a certain way. So this is one way to approach fair use is to find out does your field or profession have a code of best practices regarding uh, copyright and fair use. Um, the most, the, the fields that have the most well-developed codes um, are not surprising. Journalism, communication, film, media, um, literature such as poetry, academic libraries, documentary filmmakers, visual artists, And at the end of this presentation, I'll be providing you a bibliography that will include some citations to those codes of best practice, along with these other helpful sources. Here's an example for you. If you're an art professor, the College Art Association has developed a code of best practices. So that's very helpful because it lets you know how your peers are interpreting the law. It gives you a template or exemplar to follow. Back to the scientific, technical, and medical publishers. Here is their um, guideline for quantity limits for permissions uh, to reprint from a particular journal or article or book. So this is something if you were working in publishing that would be very important for you to know. But the nice thing about fair use is you're not limited to something this prescriptive. But in order to use the fair use um, exemptions, you need to be able to tell a pretty complicated story. Um, you need to document all four factors, your use of all four factors. So I boil it down to the why, the what, the proportion, and the value. You need to describe the purpose and character of your use. You need to describe the nature of the work you are using. You need to describe the proportion used. In other words, you need to talk about how the amount and substantiality of the portion used relates to the whole work. And then you need to analyze the, the effect that your use has upon the potential market for the work or the value of the work. This is a quote from Carrie Russell of the American Library Association, which I really like. Critical thinking required. Those who prefer a yes or no answer may be troubled by the ambiguous nature of fair use, but fair use cannot be reduced to a checklist. Fair use requires that people think. As I said previously, it requires that you construct a narrative, that you explain your use. And our interpretation of these factors is based on case law. And so that's ongoing. There's always new and nuanced interpretations because there's always new court cases. And this was one that was in the academic realm, Cambridge versus Georgia State University. 
and the, they decided the district court erred by giving each of the four factors equal weight and by treating them mechanis mechanistically the district court was told that they should have undertaken a holistic analysis which carefully balanced the four factors. So I like this decision because it fits with that critical thinking required slide that I showed you previously. It, re it requires that one look at all the factors and look at how they're, if there's any interplay, look at it in a context, in other words. And this is another finding from that case. So with regard to the third factor, which is the proportion factor, the district court erred in setting a 10% or one chapter benchmark. The district court should have performed this analysis on a work-by-work -work basis, taking into account whether the amount taken qualitatively and quantitatively was reasonable in light of the pedagogical purpose of the use and the threat of market substitution. So again, um, the court felt that it should have been analyzed in, in context. So a story, that storytelling or narr narrative factor is important. That needs to be done every time you make a fair use determination. However, it's not as complicated once you understand the basics is not as, as complicated as it may seem as first, at first because we have these tools that you can use. Um, there's one at the University of Minnesota called Fair Thoughts and it creates an email record for you and then there's another evaluator um, on the American Library Association site and they create a PDF record for you. So in other words you can use these tools and type in your situation and it only takes a little bit of your time. They're, it's a very nice, they're slick tools, and then you'll have a record of how you made your decision, which you can refer back to in case you ever do get questioned. So this is where we go to one of these sources and do the exercise. So if you can open up another browser or make a note of these um, URLs, we can do this exercise together. So here is just a situation that I've made up. So you're a professor and you want your students to read chapter 9 of this book. Is there a, a fair, you know, is there a copyright violation problem? What are your options? Can you claim copying chapter 9 is fair use? Well, we have to look at it in context. So here we go. We have to weigh the four factors. So here's the Thinking Through Fair Use site from the University of Minnesota. So the first factor is purpose and character of the use. Are you making an educational uh, use of the chapter? Is it nonprofit? Or are you transforming it? So the, all those those three factors that I just mentioned would favor fair use. But if you were doing making use of it for a commercial activity or profiting from the use, or doing something that was non-critical. Um, those would weigh against fair use. So in this case, we're going to say you're working for a public nonprofit institution 
and making educational use. So you're, you're favored for fair use as to factor one. And here's some additional information about transformative use. So if you're going to claim transformative use, you need to think about whether you've transformed it by adding new expression or meaning, or did you add value by creating new information, aesthetics, insights, and understanding. This probably would not apply to an academic social sciences work like the textbook we're talking about, but this could very well apply to something um, that was artistic or perhaps a, something you were doing a parody of. That's a typical example. So factor two, the nature of the copyrighted work. Is it factual, published, or unpublished creative? So again, factor two is going to be similar to factor one um, with that type of textbook. It's a published source and it's factual, so that favors favors you for fair use as to factor two. Next, factor three, the amount used, the proportion. So one chapter out of ten, there's ten chapters in that particular book, and it's 28 pages out of 299 total. So proportionately, it's a tenth. So this one probably favors you to some extent. And then the effect on the potential market. So fa favors fair use, are you using a lawful copy of the work? It's something you purchased or the library acquired. Um, you're only using it this one time, um, and so forth. And so, um, is it out of print, for example? Is there no way to find, track down the, per, the author, for example? Um, in this case, this is a fairly recent book, so I'm thinking there's probably some of these do not apply. There is a way to seek permission. Um, and but are you intending to use it just one time, or will you be reusing it semester after semester after semester? That's another thing to consider. Here's the effect on the potential market. If the students, say, had to purchase it as a textbook, perhaps you're impacting the market for the book. So what's your verdict? How this one could go either way depending on the context. In my opinion, I'd say if you're just going to use it for the one semester and just the one chapter out of ten, I think you could make a good fair use case. If you're going to use it repeatedly, or you were going to use more than that one chapter, I think I'd, I think you should consider other alternatives. And as I said, um, these tools, as I said, these tools will allow you to have a report sent to your email address or will give you a PDF, depending on which tool you use. In many cases, though, fair use is not the most appropriate course of action. Um, here are some examples that are, that are alternatives to fair use. Number one, you can provide a link to a subscribed article. In this example, 
the University of Northern Colorado has a subscription to the American Journal of Psychiatry. Another example is to use an open educational resource. This is a resource that's in the public domain or might, may be licensed under an intellectual property license allowing its free use. A third example is library reserves. You when you submit um, something for our course reserves, the Access Services Department will do the copyright vetting for you. They'll let you know if your uh, submission is compliant with copyright or if they, or they will ask if they have questions. Here are the guidelines they use in vetting items for copyright. Another alternative is the Copyright Clearance Center. It's a clearinghouse and you can go through, through them to pay um, a small fee for using copyrighted material. Another alternative is course packs. And the bookstore can help you with that option. Remember that licenses trump copyright law. For example, our access to psych articles gives us permission to use materials in course packs and on for electronic reserve. Another alternative is using licensed materials to which we subscribe, such as our streaming video databases. Again, these are licensed materials so they're subject to a contract, and that um, is superior over to the concept of fair use. Another alternative is to ask permission. Major publishers even provide you with forms, or you can draft a letter yourself. I'm, and uh, librarians would be glad to help you do that as well. So you recall, um, I said we would spend time on more time on the statutes today. There are guidelines the Congressional Fair Use Guidelines from 1976, and the Multimedia guides, Guidelines from 1997. But they're just interpretive. They don't have as much force as the statutes. And in fact, they've been a source of confusion. They're very prescriptive, and in fact, people have limited their fair use use of the fair use factors too much when relying on these very, very narrow prescriptive guidelines. You may have seen these classroom copyright charts. They keep turning up like a bad penny everywhere. It is our recommendation that you don't rely on these because they are too restrictive. Instead, we recommend you do the fair use calculation that we described earlier. 
this is the kind of um, interpretation you get from the guidelines. Again, it can be very limiting in a way that's not helpful. You can always pick the best outcome of the two options. The Teach Act is another statute and it was designed to catch the law up to the technology. It applies to distance education. Materials that you use need to be exclusive and integral to your class, mediated by you. Access needs to be limited and secure. You may only use limited portions of documentaries, and you may not use materials specifically marketed for distance education. And there's a tool that's very helpful in helping you determine whether what you are using for your class meets the statute. And I would recommend you look at fair use in the context of a continuum of risk. This, I believe, is the worst case scenario. And the best case scenario is a really great outcome. So consider this continuum of risk and how risk averse or tolerant you are. And consider that same, those same factors in terms of your institution, how risk averse or tolerant your institution is. I recommend an approach that is pragmatic and also ethical. And that, that I believe is your best practice. So can you think like a judge and advocate like an attorney? In other words, can you empathize with all the roles or perspectives. The U.S. copyright model is successful when the rights of users of information are in balance with the rights of authors, creators, or other copyright holders. Another nice quote from Carrie Russell. I thank you for your time today, and please contact me with any unanswered questions.